this is the sixth in our series of discussions of books written by ISRF fellows, past and present, that are all slated for the third Thursday of each month. The exception will be this year's three launch July extravaganza, which will include two new books on topics directly related to that of today's event. So I encourage you to check the launches section of the ISRF website. We're going to shift to hybrid events as soon as public health allows. Uh, special thanks to our audiences uh, this year for sticking with this webinar format well into the second year of the pandemic. We're desperately looking forward to speaking with you, not through Zoom mediation. Uh, now for tonight's topic, um, many of us in the global north who are not experts on the laws of war associate the, the law with the reduction or the confinement of war. Uh, we may have heard of the Lever Code drawn up for the US Civil War in the 1860s, the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907, and we have certainly heard of the Geneva Conventions, though perhaps not that there are four of them running from 1864 through 1949, and perhaps not that they were followed by the 1977 protocols additional to the Geneva Conventions of 1949, the first of which, quote, provides that armed conflicts in which peoples are fighting against colonial domination, alien occupation, or racist regimes are to be considered international conflicts and thus covered by the Geneva Conventions. We non-experts may or may not know the details of required distinctions between civilians and combatants, or of required proportionality of military response, or that the United States and Israel are not state parties to the 1977 additional protocol that I just quoted from. But we non-experts are still likely to associate the international laws of war with the reduction of harms in conflict zones and the law with the gradual shift of societies towards resolving disputes through negotiation rather than force of arms. We may well associate the laws of war with global progress, progress towards a world in which unequal military power does not so often issue in the destruction of people's lives. Craig Jones is one of an important body of experts who have been trying to educate the rest of us about a process that works in reverse, laws of war that enable war, that help war work, that put war at the center of the human future. His book is to me a fascinating intellectual history of the very active involvement of the militaries of two of the leading nations in this arena, Israel and the United States, in turning operational law into a regime of permissive constraint, in Rebecca Sanders' phrase, which allows what Professor Jones terms the everyday operationalization of military violence. Focusing on aerial targeting, he narrates the involvement of military lawyers in the Vietnam War, the rise of operational law in the post-Vietnam period, the lawyers' war, as he terms it, in Iraq, the role of law in Israel defense force targeting in the Gaza Strip, and the law of kill chains and drone warfare. Professor Jones's book tells a story that explains many mysteries, such as what seems to many of us to be the fake legality of civilian casualties in Gaza, whose roots he finds in operational law, or more generally, the failure of international law to keep continuous violence from becoming a feature of most, if not all territorial, religious, or resource disputes. With the book comes much understanding, and though to understand is not to forgive, to understand is to have the details that make democratic interruption of military conflict more feasible. Okay, one last thing um, before we get going, I'd like to note resonances among the books that have wound up in our launch series uh, that started back in November. In that month, in her book, Freedom, Annalene de Dang argued that the only truly valuable form of freedom is democratic freedom and not the negative individualist kind even as Western rulers have generally marginalized the democratic form. In February, in his book, An African Path to Disability Justice, Oche Onazi redefined disability justice through Ubuntu, a relational, not individualist notion of personhood, one that in Oche's reading, obliges societies to respect asymmetrical capabilities rather than taking advantage of them. In March, in his book, Victory, Kian O'Driscoll argued that to the extent that just war actually exists, 
It must emerge from a collective decision process that bears in mind a nation or group's relations to the appointed enemy. In April, in her book, Being Sure of Each Other, Kimberly Brownlee offered detailed philosophical reasons for why social rights are more fundamental than individual rights, which means we need a deep democratic restructuring of interpersonal relations. And then last month, Gabor Shearing showed the readiness with which liberal market relations can be turned into authoritarian capitalism and the need for mass vigilance against the strongman creation of accumulative states. Although this set of ISRF fellows would, where they all here today, disagree on various things from their diverse disciplines, they are mounting a collective challenge to 19th century liberal individualism and its afterlives, to its colonial projects, many of which continue, and to the neoliberal updates that have shaped the world in part through nearly continuous military violence. As Lars mentioned, we'll hear from Craig first and then from two particularly interesting experts on this topic, Lisa Hajar coming to us from Santa Barbara, California, and Catherine Chinara Charit here in London. Okay, first, uh, you've seen the notice up for Craig, so I won't uh, repeat all of that. He's a lecturer in political geography in the School of Geography, Sociology and Politics at Newcastle University here in the UK. He completed his PhD in geography fairly recently, 2017, from the University of British Columbia. Um, I would add about the second project that was listed, Wounds Without Borders, that it, uh, it samples a treatment for the sick and injured where medical and healthcare infrastructures have been destroyed often deliberately by military and paramilitary violence in Gaza, Syria, and Iraq. One of his early pieces is called Forsaking the Civilian, which captures, I think, one of the abiding ethical and intellectual concerns of his career. So Craig, over to you. It's really a pleasure to have you with us. Great, okay, thank you, Chris. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I just want to start by thanking uh, ISRF for their amazing support, um, both in finishing the book and in disseminating it, um, especially uh, to Chris for hosting this event and to Stuart Wilson and Lars Cornelson uh, for all of their work that they've done putting this together. Um, the work that ISRF do, as many of you already know, is essential. It is uh, an amazing uh, body uh, that's, that's promoting interdisciplinary research and it, your support means a lot, so thank you. I'd also like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Catherine Chere and Professor Lisa Hadjar. I'm really excited uh, to have them have read the book and I'm really looking forward to your comments. So thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us for this and um, especially this busy time. I'd also like to thank my editor of the book uh, and all of the strong passages in the book are, are his doing. Um, his name is Andrew Robertson uh, and he works uh, at uh, rewriting. I just want to give a huge shout out to him. I don't think the book would have been possible without him, and, and especially in the latter stages. And I'd also like to thank uh, Ellen O'Hara Slavic, who was responsible for the beautiful and devastating front cover, um, which is uh, a, a, an artist rendition of the, the bombing of Baghdad, which has salience for reasons I'll explain. So first, some thank yous. Right now, of course, uh, bombs are falling heavily on Gaza. And once again, there's violence being done in Palestine um, by Israel. And I wanted to start here uh, both to acknowledge that the destruction is very much ongoing and the violence still very much uh, still with us. And to draw a parallel between how I first came to this project well over a decade ago. So many of you might remember the bombing uh, of Gaza in 2008 and 2009. This is the first time that I had heard about military lawyers uh, who were the subject of the book. Uh, at the time, human rights organizations around the world, United Nations and other organizations were calling for the end of the violence, but they were also calling and using the language uh, of war crimes because Israel had targeted uh, schools, it's used white phosphorus, like in the picture there, it targeted hospitals, killed 1,500 civilians, um, and so on. And the language that they used was one uh, of law, which for me was interesting. Uh, and the second part that became interesting is Israel's response. And I first found out about the use of military lawyers because they responded, the Israeli Defense Force responded to those accusations of criminality, like Israel frequently does with a sort of offensive defense. 
uh, by saying that all of the targeting uh, of the schools, the hospitals and so, so on had been through an extensive legal review and responsible for performing that legal review with this series of professionals who at the time I'd never heard of. Uh, of course, they've been around for a lot longer, but I just discovered them then. And since then, we of course have had repetitious uh, wars uh, in, in Gaza uh, and elsewhere. Um, but I wanted to draw a parallel between that. So the book is, is unfortunately and sort of devastatingly timely. And I think no author and no scholar wants their work to be timely for reasons uh, like we're seeing today. And since then, you know, there's been this repetition of, of, of violence. And I think that's really powerful when you see the sorts of kinds of violence you see today, and, and they always come with a slight difference. So it's a repetition with a difference to do with the, the complete destruction of entire, uh, entire uh, apartment buildings uh, being felled, uh, to do with the targeting of uh, journalists and, and journalistic uh, buildings. Um, all of that stuff which we're seeing now on the daily news is passing through uh, some sort of legal review that largely takes place in Tel Aviv, where I did a lot of my interviews at uh, a military defense compound. Uh, and so I, want, I sort of wanted a, the book really gets behind the scenes of, of, of those scenes uh, and tries to understand these military lawyers uh, at work. So that was just my opening. Um, at the time, that's the news article that I first discovered, Consent and Advice. It was in Haaretz newspaper published in 2009, early 2009. As I began to, to dig deeper, military lawyers were, of course, not new. They'd been around in, in Israel and Palestine since before the founding of the Israeli state, actually. Um, but in, in 2000s, and, and especially by 2006 with the invasion of Lebanon, 2009 with Gaza, um, this was very much new in terms of the advice that military commanders gave in lethal targeting operations. And I won't read the full quote there, but that's one of the quotes from one of my key interviewees uh, from the Israeli military, who sort of describes a time when commanders couldn't even remember, you know, having a lawyer and now they can't really move without them. And as, that, as a metaphor that, you know, the military cannot sort of get on with daily business without its conduct of lawyers, I think speaks powerfully to the impact that lawyers uh, have today. Very quick background. As I've said, military lawyers in Israel have been around since the founding of the Israeli state. In the US, they've been around for even longer. So the JAG corps to which military lawyers belong boasts that it's the largest and oldest law firm in America. Um, they've been around for doing all kinds of things, which I won't go into. But the bit where I become really interested uh, is a little bit in Vietnam. Uh, but especially in the first Gulf War. In the first Gulf War, the invasion of Iraq uh, is interesting because that is the first time there an, an invasion of Panama about a year earlier that the US military deploy for the first time military lawyers uh, to do these target reviews to sort of be on the ground uh, in forward operating bases. So at the time they were based in Saudi Arabia. So I become interested in, in this key period, although I trace a, a, a sort of longer history. And the argument in the book is that really in the post 9-11 era uh, of, of the, the so-called war on terror, not just in Iraq and Afghanistan, but also the sort of everywhere wars that have spiraled outwards ever since, uh, is where military lawyers really have done, uh, made their major contributions and deployments to this particular area uh, that I've been interested in. In terms of the scope of the book, um, I mean, Chris has given a kind introduction there, so I, I, I won't uh, talk too much about this slide. But the focus is primarily on the US and Israel. There are some other states that sort of flicker in and out, including the UK uh, and Saudi Arabia, including Russia a little bit. But it's primarily about the US targeting operations in three, in three spaces. That's Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, and, and, and uh, occupied Palestinian territories. Uh, and as I say, uh, for reasons I won't go into fully, but the, the history starts in the Vietnam War, and that's essential uh, because of uh, this invention of, of, of what the US military uh, term operational law, they come out of Vietnam, uh, seeing the laws of war as a restrictive regime that's, that's hampered them, that's sort of one of the excuses for US military failures, the lack of victory in Vietnam, and they come out of that and sort of internalize the international laws of war uh, and use it and mine it as a sort of resource and opportunity that they call operational law. Um, and so that's really where the his history gets started, although the military lawyers don't get deployed themselves uh, until uh, many years later. So there's this sort of 
if almost boring bureaucratic history in the 70s and 80s whereby this institutionalization uh, happens. In terms of just what I did, and, and I'd be happy to, to take questions about the, the methodology and the interviews I did, the book's primarily based on interviews, uh, not necessarily easy to get interviews with, with military lawyers uh, of, of, of the main states that were involved in the book, and I did lots of, some also interviews with Australian and UK military lawyers and some, some continental European lawyers. And then um, that middle section there is just about the, the widespread amount of documents and, and stuff that's published on uh, these sorts of things. The US military is a prolific publisher of doctrine of just stuff, whether it's leaked or, or deliberately published. Uh, and so there's a lot to get one's teeth into in this area of law, um, although it can be very secretive and there are re uh, certain limitations to what one can find out, there is still you know, a massive amount to trawl through stuff that I was never able to get to, of course, as well. Um, and I also did some some archival research, especially uh, for the Vietnam period, um, based out of um, out of Maryland, um, Virginia. Now, the, just the nuts and bolts of, of the book and the argument, and sorry for all the text here, but I, I just wanted to communicate the argument and then hopefully we can use that as a basis for the discussion and, and, and the Q&A afterwards. As I see it, I think, um, you know, arguments develop even after the book, uh, after the book has been written. But as I see it, there are two sets of arguments which, um, which, which move across the book. Um, at, so I just want to demonstrate those two arguments. The first argument has, has three sets, and it's this, that the laws of war that, that Chris kindly introduced there, variously called international humanitarian law, including Geneva, including Hague, uh, have, I think, some sort of indeterminacy at their core. And that, determin in, that determinacy, I think, Chris uh, usefully began to unpack for me, uh, speaks, I think, to our public's, international public's um, understanding of what the laws of war should be, i.e. that is for the protection of civilians, versus what the military believe they are, i.e. Uh, they are a set of laws which uh, and it should be uh, uh, not unduly constrained militaries uh, to do whatever it is that they need to do. So I think it's sort of charitable reading, few people disagree with this, I think, is that there is some sort of indeterminacy. We disagree on how much the laws are indeterminate. Uh, but that's the sort of first step of the argument, to acknowledge this, this sort of constructivist work on the indeterminacy of the law. The second part is to say that that is... Uh, an indeterminacy which is taken up by human rights groups for advocacy, for to advocate for the civilians, but it's taken up on the other side, which is for me the, the equally important but less looked at side, it's taken up as a resource uh, for exploitation. Uh, and so the US military, when they institutionalize law, uh, they, they look at law as a force uh, multiplier. Uh, and the argument in the book is that states because they are the ones involved in doing the war, that they are sort of have uh, not the monopoly on interpretation, uh, but they are able to sort of put their interpretation into worldly work and, and hence the violence done in the name of the law. And then, sec and then the final part of this argument is that once you've exploited that indeterminacy, the very actualization of that indeterminacy, be that law on self-defense, be that preemptive self-defense, uh, be that um, hostile intent, all of these sorts of things which are, which are written into or can be interpreted, then become a way of doing future warfare. So that's another way of saying that interpretation is, is of course performative, it sets sort of legal precedent, it pushes the boundaries of law, uh, and here I'm drawing on, on among others, on, on Lisa Hajar's work in terms of how whole paradigms of entire ways of doing war, i.e. The, the account terror paradigm, a way of doing war, then becomes sort of part and parcel of how uh, the worldly life of war is actually fought uh, and understood today. And then we have mimicry, we have Saudi Arabia uh, sort of copying methodologies of, of how we do war uh, in terms of how they're conducting their war in Yemen. So that's one of the, that's the sort of really worrying part of this is, is that sort of precedent creating stuff. In terms of the impact that those arguments have, it helps me to make just a small nuance on arguments that have already been made. And just to, just to demonstrate that, that nuance, but one I think is important is this distinction that I make it with my engagement with an important book uh, by Jens David Oaklin which provides a sort of liberal account of law uh, and, and, and 
the argument is in the post sort of Guantanamo era that international law is under attack. Uh, my argument is that international law is under attack, but that the medium of assault is also international law itself. Uh, and I have a sort of less essentialist uh, view of international law as something which is a sort of, you know, for the rights uh, of the good. Uh, and so international law is the thing which is also being exploited. So it's, it's both, if, if you think it's under attack, then what is it under attack? It, it's not the thing which is attacking, it's not outside of the law, it's not just politics. So this is about the law politics distinction. All of which is to say, of course, is that I think that the law is part of the problem as well as potentially uh, not being or not necessarily being the full solution. And then the second argument um, that runs across the book is about responsibility. And I know I've gone on for a little too long, so let me just uh, rush through this. The book is about the kill chain. I'll say more about that in a second. Um, the kill chain, if we think about it, all the things that you need to do in order to target uh, and kill someone or, or to target and destroy a particular place or building. And that has a series of actors. I've been amazed at the research over the last decade at how many, literally how many people it takes in order to fulfill a modern, uh, late modern military operation with, with all of the technologies. And so the argument is threefold, that war takes place, of course, of, across a, a vast spatio-temporal uh, terrain, uh, and the acts of war themselves are, uh, are dispersed, uh, and with them the responsibilities for certain decision-making. Um, the allocation, the second part, the allocation of responsibility uh, is, is continually displaced, uh, not just among people, so this isn't just the sort of Zygmunt Bauman's uh, division of labor type argument, but that also it's mediated by all sorts of culture, techno-cultural uh, assemblages, so um, responsibilities are, are, are dished out to algorithms, to drones, uh, to, uh, to other uh, technologies within uh, the system, uh, to digital ways of seeing. And the lie that comes with military lawyers is that they can be bought into this stuff, cut through it and provide some sort of objective truth. Uh, you know, is it legal? Is it not legal? Uh, what is the risk? Should we go ahead? Should we not? Uh, and the research shows that again and again, even with military lawyers in the, in the loop, they are uh, invited to clarify things, but in doing so, bring their own sets of problems. Uh, and so you have it almost, almost, it would be funny if it wasn't so serious, uh, disagreements among military lawyers uh, over, over the very simple definitions or what one would think of as very simple definitions. So they come in and, and uh, the, the idea that is that they cut through the fog of war, but my argument is that they, they sort of multiply the fog of war uh, and, and it just, it's just another layer uh, of fog for us to see through, if you like. Uh, this is, this is a, just a, 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 a represent, <laughs> representation of the of the kill chain. Uh, it's also called, uh, the US military refer to it uh, as the donut of death. Uh, and the latter chapters in the book really take this up and take it to pieces uh, in, in terms of uh, two, two ways of doing targeting. One is pre-planned and one is sort of live. Uh, so you have um, uh, situations where, you know, you can plan targets in advance versus ones where targets emerge in real time and you have to sort of, you know, uh, execute them quickly. And I interviewed military lawyers that are involved in each part of those uh, bureaucratic chains. And time and time again, they, uh, they talk about their responsibility. They talk about the dispersal of responsibility. Uh, they talk uh, about uh, not necessarily uh, being uh, welcome in there to stop uh, military operations. Uh, they talk about getting thrown under the bus if they say no. Uh, they, they talk about lots of things. Uh, one of them referred to himself as more like a chaplain that, that goes, uh, that gets sought to legal advice uh, because uh, commanders want sort of moral uh, absolution uh, for their actions. Others talk about um, lawyers being an absolutely necessary part uh, in order to, and this is a direct quote, get other human beings to kill people uh, in the name of the state love to talk more uh, about that but it's an ultimately bureaucratic process which I try to bring to life which I try to people which I try to uh, to sort of show uh, because there's this bureaucracy a necropolitical bureaucracy a bureaucracy of death which is is impenetrable even having written a book about it very difficult to sort of understand very difficult to trace the geographies who's involved what happens how does this thing how does how do we produce death uh, in late modern war is, is a sort of complicated question 
And um, so I think, I think I'll actually end there. I had more things to say uh, because part of the book tries to explain why that has happened. And I think that's in some ways uh, the more important part of the book in terms of explaining things. But all of which is to say that we have arrived now in a time that is variously called uh, you know, lawfare, this idea that law has been reduced to a weapon of war. Uh, and so the book says that you know, it, war is not necessarily lawful, but is certainly full of law in terms of sort of being brimming with law, legal discourse, legal professionals. Uh, and so as David Kennedy said that war is a, is a sort of modern legal institution. David Kennedy and I disagree as to, as to um, you know, the direction things should go or what should happen. Uh, over that. Um, but I think I will, I'll just skip forward this uh, and I will end there. And I'm really looking forward to your comments. I hope that's given you some sort of uh, some, some, um, the bare bones of the argument and discussion. And uh, thank you so much. The first is uh, Catherine Chinara Charitz, who is a lecturer in global politics at the University of Westminster here in London. And I'll just add to the screen note that you've already read that they are going to launch a, a recent book called The EU, Hamas, and the 2006 Palestinian Elections, colon, A Performance in Politics, as part of our aforementioned July launch extravaganza. They use uh, transdisciplinary methods inspired by queer, feminist, and abolitionist roots to rethink questions of sovereignty and justice in contemporary politics. Catherine, it's really a pleasure to have you here. Great. Well, th thanks so much for inviting me. Um, so first, uh, I want to commend Craig on an extremely well researched and accessible text on the legal frameworks that surround war making. Um, there's an impressive amount of uh, interview material here, which goes through the deliberations um, in uh, these war making spaces, which I think is, is essential uh, for researchers um, and an extremely accessible text uh, as well. And I want to thank the ISRF uh, for the opportunity to be part of this conversation. And uh, they've been amazing uh, at keeping me involved in things um, uh, since I was a fellow with them uh, a few years back. So um, my response, I think, reflects my interest in uh, performative rituals uh, and specifically the performativity of legal texts uh, on the conduct of empire. Um, and I wanna start with the departure point of what is at stake with the increased presence of military lawyers uh, at the stage of targeting, right? Which was what uh, Craig's book is about, particularly in the US and Israel, as he mentioned, um, as these sites set new precedents for war making around the world. Um, and, and Craig traces these uh, shifts um, through key sites in US imperial war fronts from Vietnam both Gulf Wars, uh, Gaza, Palestine, Afghanistan, amongst others. So in uh, the text, Craig refers to the presence of lawyers in war making as a kind of calibration of force. It is not that lawyers necessarily reduce the number or likelihood that civilians will be killed and that attacks in war will be less likely but rather legal frameworks are involved in a kind of calibration, legal, technical, or otherwise. So my first sort of area of, of questions or concerns is what are the implications of this management that I think Craig's call, Craig calls sorting for rendering certain practices of war more or less visible? An example might be that indirect deaths from the destruction of infrastructure uh, which happened, uh, which Craig accounts for happened in the first Gulf War, are perhaps harder to trace, um, and so making people less uh, culpable uh, for these events, but they're no less deadly. So is there a potential shift towards practices that result in slow death instead of more spectacular forms of killing? Um, so is uh, you know, legal frameworks involved in uh, shifting the sites of war um, and making certain practices uh, less seen or seen as less problematic uh, when lawyers become involved in the war making space. Uh, you explain, for example, that targeted assassinations uh, were employed covertly by the US and Israel. Um, and then these discussions became uh, uh, 
involved in legal frameworks, and I'm wondering, therefore, making them perhaps more visible, but then at the same time more acceptable. So I think, uh, you know, the, 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 the relationship between legal frameworks and visibility is not so clear cut, right? So it can render certain practices more hidden, but others uh, more visible, but therefore acceptable. I wonder if maybe you might want to comment, uh, and this maybe relates to some of your more recent work, um, on the difference between the legal frameworks that Israel has uh, used to frame, for example, the knock on the roof tactics, which I mean, have perhaps rendered these tactics more visible, but then at the same time, uh, more acceptable um, for certain audiences. And I think it was interesting, you, you talked about the indeterminacy of war in your presentation um, and how this relates to different audiences. So, sorry, I'll, I'll come back to my point, was this difference between uh, the knock on the roof tactics, rendering them more visible, uh, but perhaps acceptable, and then maybe rendering other practices less visible, such as snipers used around the Great March of Return. Um, so, you know, kind of managing uh, what are sort of more or less visible practices of, of warfare. So we hear less about the snipers and the kind of implications uh, those have for uh, the protesters in the Gaza Strip. And I know that relates to some of your more current work. So this leads to my second point around the implications of war lawyers for the longevity or endurance of wars in the context of imperial and settler colonial strategies. So citing uh, a particular uh, a tactical directive, so part of think of the US uh, command chain, so I'm quoting here and says, we, so they, the army, must avoid the trap of winning tactical victories, but suffering strategy, strategic defeats by causing civilian casualties or excessive damages, thus alienating people. Uh, so limiting casualty deaths for the sake of winning wars. And then, so I ask, but have a people been won over by only bombing them slightly? Now, while this question might seem crass, it reflects that perhaps the purpose of some wars is not to win them. And in the case of empire and settler colonialism have very different objectives, such as the expansion of empire or maintaining racial or civilization, civilizationalist argument, uh, hierarchies. So how might, you know, I'm asking, how might lawyers being involved in drawing wars out for longer periods of time, allowing troops to be deployed to new areas uh, uh, on the frontiers of empire, uh, perhaps even uh, things like reflecting on uh, the second uh, Gulf War, uh, being involved in investment cases, insurance cases around infrastructures. So all these different dynamics um, that, that lawyers might also be involved in. And Craig asks in the conclusion a very, very compelling question, which is what is at stake in war uh, becoming more full of law, not necessarily to constrain it, but how is war understood in relation to law, legal discourses, and legal debates? My last point has to do with the routinization of uh, war making through legal frameworks. Um, so so uh, uh, Craig's argument um, develops uh, uh, incredibly coherently throughout the entire text, and it kind of maintains this feeling of a kind of routine or cycle, right? That, that new laws or legal frameworks or the introduction of military lawyers um, a, a shift, right, uh, throughout the, the different periods that he's looking at uh, around shifts in technology, for example, or specific crises. So he talks about the My Lai massacre in Vietnam. So particular events that lead to shifts in, in, in the involvement of lawyers in targeting practices. Now, these shifts may mitigate against civilian casualties or not. Uh, the book highlights the elasticity of these rules, so um, they may be applied unevenly, and they're just as likely to be followed or, or broken, and I think maybe Lisa might, might highlight some of these things more. Um, so Craig therefore interrogates a kind of routinization or the banalization of legal frameworks around war making. And I think this encourages us to ask a, a, a really important but di different set of questions, right? What is the performativity of these rules? Um, so if they're, you know, what, what work are they doing? And in the conclusion, uh, 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 Craig cites uh, someone who says that the legal advice is being used by military forces and their commanders to help reinforce in the mind of the combatants what they are doing is the right thing. Um, so I think Craig referred to this as the chaplain, right? I think this is the same person, actually. So convince troops that they're doing the right thing. I wonder if, Craig, you, 
uh, might expand on this, but also perhaps take it in a slightly different direction in that the legal discussions contribute to making war appear more complex and complicated. Um, so the increased presence of lawyers are reflecting a culture of trying to hide the asymmetries of the US's war against its enemies, trying to make what is an extremely uneven landscape perhaps appear more even. Um, and you cite Anthony Angie's work in the conclusion, which I think is really important here. Uh, so are these legal frameworks used to make uh, war seem really complex, uh, rules of engagement, uh, acronyms, a kind of gamification of war, um, and, and, and trying to deal with what is an extremely asymmetrical relationship between the US and those it's going to war with, or again, Israel and those, and, and, and who's, and those who Israel is going to war with. Um, so trying to make uh, these enemies extremely uh, dynamic and complex um, uh, way of engaging in warfare, right? So trying to, to make that asymmetrical relationship appear more symmetrical. So I want to conclude with a few comments on the relevance of Craig's work for understanding what uh, we began with, which is the current attacks on the Gaza Strip. We know that various structures and persons have been both murdered and martyred in the past two weeks including the destruction of the Al Jala media tower and the murder of Dr. Ayman Abu al of the head of internal medicine, also the murder of Gaza's top neurologist and his family, uh, Dr. Muin al Aoul. Um, several tweets read like this, Israel has bombed the largest bookstore, an ice cream factory, the only COVID test facility, an orphanage, a high school, beach cafes, MSF clinics. Craig's book interrogates, but also begins to move beyond the question of were these attacks illegal or did war lawyers make these attacks more or less likely? The conclusion, the conclusion of Craig's book cautions against activism that is now concerned with the legality of war rather than with a kind of Vietnam era anti-war stance more generally. Um, this returns to the question of what is at stake in the legal framings of war. Um, the Associated Press, who held an office in the destroyed Al Jala Tower, released a statement after Israel bombed its office in the Gaza Strip uh, a week ago. Um, and and, it, and it, it goes like this. We re so this is AP Press, right? After their own building had just been destroyed. We received a warning that the building would be hit. So this is the knock on the roof. Um, the Israeli government uh, says that the building contained Hamas intelligent assets. We have no indication uh, Hamas was in the building or active in the building. This is something we actively check to the best of our ability. We would never knowingly put our journalists at risk. So does this quote reflect that legal questions are making certain practices of war more visible, more acceptable, uh, contributing to the long durée of imperial wars, and also covering up uh, the asymmetries of uh, anti-colonial warfare, anti-colonial resistance and, and colonial warfare? Um, Great. Thank you, Craig. I really, really, really enjoyed reading your book. Um, and I, I look forward to your comments. Thank you, Catherine. That was great. Um, it was, <laughs> I, I, I'm really having a hard time restraining myself from jumping in and asking a bunch of questions myself. But um, on to Lisa. Uh, then Craig will have the opportunity to respond to specific things that you would like to address in the comments, more sort of as a corrective than as a a reopening of a bunch of issues, and then we are going to turn it over to the audience. Uh, Professor Lisa Hajar is, uh, works in the sociology department at the University of California at Santa Barbara. And in addition to the screen information that you've already seen, I will add that her new book, The War in Court, The Inside Story of the Fight Against Torture and the War on Terror is very, very close to being finished. She's one of the few social scientists who have done has done research in the US military prison at Guantanamo, having visited that facility at least 14 times. She also writes about law and culture, and she has written for The Nation, Al Jazeera English, Middle East Report, among other uh, publications. Lisa, thank you for being here. And um, thank you very much, Craig, for writing such a fascinating book, even though <clears throat> so, you know the people that you uh, interviewed and the topics that you work on <clears throat> are in some ways familiar to me because I've done some kinds of overlapping work. It was just an incredible eye-opening experience to 
to really understand how you have framed things in such a compelling way. And it's a great ethnography of the state in, some, in addition to everything else. So I'm just gonna point out a few um, things that really caught my mind when I reread the book. One of them was, you know, it was really fascinating uh, Craig's interpretation or you know explanation about the Phoenix program, which was the CIA run operation during the Vietnam War era. And what Craig argues in the book is that you know the the Vietnam War was the first um, war where military lawyers were really sort of br being brought in, although it was a very novel kind of an idea, um, you know, in terms of giving legal permission to certain things. And one of the main objectives of the military lawyers, the JAGs in Vietnam was to really determine and deal with people who were captured. And so it was this, you know, I mean, almost pre, like a really clear precursor to the, you know, the US war on terror um, for many reasons. But the Phoenix program um, emerged to sort of uh, deal with torture, kill, et cetera, people who were not clearly identifiable as prisoners of war, North Vietnamese prisoners of war. And it was in a sense, the um, sort of the, the area where lawyers didn't go, you know, where the Phoenix program blossomed and bloomed um, in, in, you know, to the <laughs> grotesque consequences. And it was in a sense, you know, perhaps the combination of the Phoenix program's horrific death toll and complete failure as an intelligence gathering operation that was part of the story that Craig also narrates very well is the post-Vietnam efforts inside the United States to clean up their act and to kind of really recommit and show that the law is a good and powerful thing. And so you see this, these kind of tracks where the CIA is inherently a lawless operation and the military is, as Craig argues very compellingly, an increasingly lawful um, operation. So if we just even think about, you know, sort of that Vietnam history and then what happens after 9-11 vis-a-vis the United States um, approach to the terrorist attacks of 9-11 and, and the start of the war on terror, <clears throat> Um, you know, Dick Cheney takes over as, uh, you know, sort of directing national security strategy and, um, you know, after 9-11 and President George W. Bush basically taps the CIA to be the, um, the tip of the spear because of its lawlessness because of its inherent disregard, you know, so as a civilian organization, the CIA is not subject to the laws of war. And so the CIA begins this parallel track um, to the great disgrace of, of, the, of the country. But it, you know, in some sense that what was authorized for the CIA then um, leaks over to the US military because in a sense, Donald Rumsfeld, who was Secretary of Defense, was really, like Cheney, was very hostile to the kind of post-Vietnam legal cleanup of its own house that the military had done. And so the JAGs were really cut out of um, interrogation and detention um, policy making, and then were forced to basically go along with the pro tortury you know hell with the law kind of approach that the CIA had you know was was re recuperating from its uh, phoenix um, days but i want to then just like link over to how the kind of the history of israel that um, craig talks about you know can also we see them is as um, mutually reinforcing i mean so so one of the um, points that Craig makes in the book is the very significant role in the immediate aftermath of Israel's occupation of Gaza, West Bank, and East Jerusalem, you know, how the legal framework was set. And it literally, the, the, the setting of the legal framework for Israel's occupation um, was defined by someone who features in, in Craig's book, features in some of the work that I've done, is a guy named Mer Shamgar, who was the head of the military um, MAG, the military 
whatever. It's the head legal guy. Um, and, and he basically had a radical right wing political views and, 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 and then in, did exactly what Craig talks about, like interpreting, using the indeterminacy of the law to argue that those areas, West Bank and Gaza, were sui generis because they were not the sovereign territories of, you know, of nobody, and there was no Palestinian state. And so Shumgar like sort of interprets the inapplicability of the Geneva Conventions over these militarily occupied territories through his interpretation that, you know, stateless peoples are not the beneficiaries of the Geneva Convention. And he set really the legal paradigm of colonial dispossession and militarized repression that has evolved over, um, over time. So to link it back then to the United States, you know, on at the at the urging of civilian lawyers after 9-11, um, especially that right wing band of, you know, uh, you know, legal criminals uh, surrounding uh, Cheney, David Addington, John Yu and others, they basically urged or insisted that President Bush would do something that actually Shamgar was the one who had originally done, which is like, the Geneva Conventions are great, they just don't apply here. And so that argument that no Geneva Conventions, you know, was sort of like no crime, you know, no uh, crime without law. And so it opens up all the avenues for um, the legal debauchery that characterized the war on terror. Um, and so, but it's been, you know, in some ways a real uh, debacle and a disaster for the United States, um, you know, and certainly it's it, very difficult to clean up messes that are made through law. You know, like when law, when law is the vehicle for making crime and messes, you know, so even when Obama came, um, to office his first national security uh, speech in May of 2009, one of his, you know, critiques was, oh, I inherited a legal mess. But then, of course, Obama owns this legal mess, which is the completely mis- or, you know, reinterpreted inapplicability of the Geneva Conventions, et cetera. And he owned it and, and actually gave it its own name, which is the oxymoronic title of domestic humanitarian law. And so in some ways we are now living in sort of the shadows of, you know, Shumgar's brilliance, quote unquote brilliance, and, and the, you know, sort of like the owning of this domestic um, versions of, of international humanitarian law. Um, just, I don't, don't want to talk too much. I also want to um, just maybe point out one little, uh, two aspects of this about coming back to the question of war lawyers. Um, you know, certainly many JAGs have gone along with, you know, the, you know, the program started in the Bush administration, continued under Obama, et cetera. But one of the things that was really sort of surprising to me and other lefties after 9-11 um, uh, was, and it, these are people who I now have come to know very well because, you know, I like, I'm writing a book about some of them, um, is, you know, that military lawyers really were an incredible source, some military lawyers were an incredible source of pushback and fighting over these, you know, misinterpretations or reinterpretations of um, U.S. obligations under international law. And so it's it had an interesting, it's sort of, you know, what, what uh, um, you know, Ma uh, Marone, Theodore Marone had talked about the humanization of humanitarian law. It's like the, the you know, humanization of, of, of military lawyers in some sense through these processes. Um, just, I'm going to conclude just with two points. I want to, um, we should talk about Gaza, um, you know, and I'd like to get Chris's comments, but so one point I'd ask about Gaza today is, you know, one of the clear arguments that comes out more so for the United States, perhaps than Israel, but was the idea of making the law work for the military. That was, you know, really, and so part of making the law work for the military, so the military wouldn't be hostile to international law, but rather see it as enabling or facilitating uh, military operations. Um, you know, it is the, the part of that was about this kind of hearts and minds argument, like both, you know, that if the you know, U.S. public perceives 
uh, military operations is abiding by legal commitments. That would be one aspect. And, you know, to the extent that U.S., you know, the countries where the U.S. was waging and has been waging the war on terror, there was a little bit of the hearts and minds uh, idea that, you know, let's have precision targeting and let's, you know, do this kind of thing. But I'm wondering, you know, in terms of Gaza today, it seems like um, Israel is like, you know, whereas they had done those kinds of legalistic responses to Operation Cast Lead and, you know, critiques of the Goldstone Report, but it doesn't seem like Israel today is even bothering to perform, you know, uh, abiding by the principles of international humanitarian law, proportionality, distinction, necessity, et cetera. So I'm wondering if Chris has, if that concurs with what Chris um, is seeing or if he has a different take. And then the very last thing, just to conclude with, you know, what I always like to talk about torture, um, you know, just very, you know, talking about military lawyers just last week in a case um, of one of the people who's at Guantanamo who spent years in um, CIA black sites, Abdurrahim al-Nashiri, you know, he's being, you know, theoretically prosecuted in the military commissions, although the military commissions are, you know, sort of ridiculous. Um, you know, in, in, in the new military judge in Al-Nashiri's case basically just issued a ruling, um, or, or rather, I'm sorry, uh, it, was, it, it was a plea deal in the Majid Khan case that would have bearing on the Nashri case that tortured statements uh, can be used, that it's, 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 it's okay, even though U.S. law, you know, during Obama tried to clean up those misinterpretations of the law, now it's like they're just abandoning it. So anyway, that's all I would like to hear what Craig has to say, and thank you, Craig, for writing such a fascinating book. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll try and limit, as Chris has said, because um, I, I really want to get to the Q&A as well, and, and, and the audience waiting. Um, I think one of the key things, uh, Catherine, to, to your first point about uh, slow death uh, and about um, the argument I think needs to be, and it's one I'm increasingly making, but one which is not necessarily well made in the book, is that current in the current incarnations of international humanitarian law as applied systematically fails to seriously consider reverberating effects of a military action. So the question is, what is the responsibility of a military to consider all of the effects that a, uh, you know, blowing up uh, electricity production factory will have uh, on injuries, on medications, on the livelihood of the population, on the health, on access to healthcare, on all of these things, which are quite reasonably impossible in some ways uh, to compute. International humanitarian law has a language for that. It's called unnecessary suffering. It's not a particularly well-developed uh, area of law. Uh, and so I think that the responsibility when it comes to proportionality analyses, ultimately are a calculation of death and only death, death and, and maybe some destruction. So we have a military objective. What is the immediate cost? How many people will be killed and what will we destroy then and there in that moment for that few minutes of the strike whilst the buildings collapse? Everything that happens after that in the sort of slow violence sense in, in the in the end durational harm is outside of that computation as far as I can understand it uh, and that comes through you know in the book in some ways but in other ways with with your snipers um, to, to only shoot someone in the kneecap is to ensure that that person lives with a lifelong injury a lifelong injury an average of six surgeries to get it fixed an average of further six uh, surgeries to um, uh, throughout the life of that victim to, for example, be supported with uh, um, amputations and um, prosthetics and so on and so forth. As it currently stands, this is one of my critiques of the law, is, is, that, is that as far as I understand it, militaries don't even have to calculate those things. Uh, that would be a far too high a threshold for them. And, and that, that gives way to all kinds of problems, such as the sort of re-devastation of Gaza. So yeah, we bomb, it bomb, Gaza is being bombed, but all of those effects from 2009, uh, from all those wars are still being felt, just like Iraq is still feeling the 1991 bombing and those sanctions. I'd, I'd really like your other questions and comments too, but let me let me just go to Lisa just to keep it quick, otherwise I'll, I'll, I'll talk all day. Um, Lisa, which one of yours shall I take? Um, let me take the, the sort of some of the comments towards the end. I think you're totally right. You know, I mean, 
I think sometimes I'm in danger when I speak about the military lawyers as a profession, the JAG corps as a, as a sort of corp, as a unit, as a professional unit that, uh, that I'm sort of picking on the individuals. I think by and large that these are, I don't even know what I mean by this, but good people in, in sort of Hannah Arendt's banality of evil good. Um, they are, you know, liberal lawyers, they're smart people. They are, um, they have even good faith interpretations. I think not not interpretations uh, that that I agree with necessarily, but what happens in, is in that very daily routinization of what it is that they're involved in the targeting operation. So I spoke to one military lawyer actually after I published a book just a couple of weeks ago. He was deployed in Afghanistan, attached to a special operations force base, which is the, you know the stuff we see in the news. It, it was in Australian uh, special forces were recently found to have committed crimes with these special units who would go door to door at night time and do house raids and, and kill civilians. Um, he was in one of those units. He was involved in a thousand targeting operations. He, a thousand over the course of just a two year period. So this is, I mean, to, where routine, the, the book can't even begin to communicate the routine, getting woken up with a pager at 3 a.m. in the night and getting, getting asked to sort of give this you know, advice, especially after having lost some troop members. So they're part of military culture, they're part of the sort of indoctrination, they receive military training, they fire guns themselves, you know, those sorts of things, although they're not involved in daily combat. So if I come to your point about, I think you're totally right, it's not that, you know, that they're certainly not bad people, um, and I know that's not, what, not even what you were sort of saying. Military lawyers push back in a really important way against Guantanamo. They wrote quite, and you, you know, you've documented them a lot better than I have, um, their opposition to Guantanamo, their opposition to habeas corpus, you know, that all went to sort of shit uh, during Guantanamo and the torture. In Israel, there's actually a parallel, I think. Every single military lawyer that I talked to Israel was sort of pro-targeting, pro, you know, daily occupation, pro everything, except the settlement. That was their exception. They were like, it's just like, we, we, like we're not even creative enough to find a, an international legal framework that announce the, the settlements because it's illegal under the laws of occupation. So they don't even bother. It proceeds to happen, happen and it takes place every day all the time, but not under a, a legal framework, which at least they are willing to sort of stand behind and justify. So if we see those, the Guantanamo exception in the US, the, the, the settlements exception in Israel, it's sort of everything else, you know, that daily sort of stuff. Those make the headlines because, you know, they're sort of the big, but it's the daily, you know, and there's a question I see here coming in that most civilian deaths are, are legal. It's, it's that, it's sort of, sort of uncontroversial daily warfare stuff that where I think they really do their work uh, in, in a non sort of, in a, yeah, in a sort of Arendtian banality of evil way. Um, so yeah, I, I'd love to talk more about everything else, but thank you both so much for your comments and I look forward to everyone else's questions. Thank you, Craig. Um, we have a first question from Adad Naam on, uh, Craig, this is for you. How do why actually, yeah, you can, others can chime in as well if you have thoughts about this. How do war lawyers compare to corporate lawyers who also exploit legal indeterminacies to serve the interests of powerful agents? Did the military learn from the corporate world's use of lawyers? Thank you. Great question. I'm not fully qualified to speak on the corporate side, other than the fact that my sister's a corporate lawyer and goes to. Um, great ends to ensure, ensure that um, Kuwaiti oil extraction is, is sort of up to date and, and the oil flows very fast. Uh, I think that there's actually incidentally a lot of language uh, in, in, in even the doctrine and certainly in the sort of daily language that military lawyers use. They refer to the Department of Defense as their client. So there's that relationship. Uh, when uh, and they refer to the commanders of their clients, the commanders understand them as their sort of personal lawyer, as if it's sort of you know a right to attorney type thing. So I think that there are you know facile sort of uh, crossovers. But one thing which you see is, I mean, they're called they're called many things military lawyers. They can be called judge advocates, which is misleading because they're you know the advice is supposed to be neutral, but they're an advocate. They're clearly advocates, and they clearly have a sort of you know they're involved in the day to day stuff. Uh, whereby I think that they are interested in, in, you know, if you look at their mandate, if you read this stuff, their job is to ensure that the client, the Department of Defense or, or the Israeli Defense Force has what it needs in order to fight legally. And uh, their job is to ensure that within the bounds of what has been legally created or facilitated, enabled, uh, can take place. How much that explicitly borrows from corporate law you know, I don't know because I don't know enough about corporate law, um, but I would say that there's lots of crossover. 
uh, in the same way that there's crossover between all these all these JAGs end up at the ICRC, uh, International Committee of the Red Cross, worryingly enough, and, and at places like Human Rights Watch and stuff, which is worrying, but they, you know, they also come in and out of the corporate world. Incidentally, Lisa, the, the key guy who was involved in the Phoenix program, there was one lawyer who I tracked down. He was a massive corporate lawyer. He, he, he did all the legal stuff for the justification of, of the Phoenix program. Uh, so fascinating. They were tracked down and um, a corporate lawyer in, in Hong Kong, uh, making millions, has a fancy website and, uh, you know, all the rest of it. Great. The second question is from Rafi Rensnik. How much are Israeli lawyers preoccupied with and directing their decisions towards appeasing international public opinion? If they believe in the determinacy of international law, how do they reconcile this determinacy with their efforts to do a Hasbara via legal interpretation? Are there gaps between their sources in Hebrew and in English? Yeah, great question. Lisa should probably chime in on this one as well. Um, I think that it, it is not accidental that, for example, the Israeli Defense Force spokesperson unit has its English channel, is on Twitter at the moment, you know, going wild. And, and those are the, some of the, the quotes that Catherine read out as well. It is not incidental that all of their investigations, quote unquote, into civilian casualties are all published in English. It's not incidental that the Israeli Supreme Court publishes most or many of its decisions in English. If we can assume that the, one of the publics is the Israeli, is, are Israelis and that most Israelis or all Israelis read Hebrew, then the question is why are they publishing in English? And I think it's because they are aware both of the international audiences, that is the English speaking audiences, especially in the United States, but also, and it speaks to the sort of lawmaking argument, the availability of certain legal interpretation for, uh, uh, for international take up. This is how we're doing law. This is how we're making law. This is how we're justifying it. I mean, they'll do press briefings, uh, of course, even in English. Some of the most controversial press briefings in the early days of the Intifada were, were done in English in terms of the justification for the whole paradigm uh, of war, as Lisa has documented. Uh, and so I think, uh, yeah, I think w that we are, you know, uh, as English speakers, one of the key audiences, if not the main audience, because in my dealings with, uh, you know, having lived in Israel for a long time, they seem to know less than educated uh, audiences in the English speaking world about what it is that their military lawyers are doing. I mean, they, you know, at the start when I was first doing my research, uh, you know, my Israeli friends were, all thought I was insane that they had these military lawyers doing all this stuff. Um, so I think we are, we are a key audience. If, and I hope that answers your question. Feel free to, to, to chime in Lisa as well. Actually, I was just, I mean, it kind of goes to my last, I mean, it's an excellent question. It goes to my last point. One of the things, you know, thinking about the sort of the dynamic dialogical thing that, you know, the, the amount of violence in 2014 and the, you know, the consequences, or well, even earlier in, you know, 2008, nine, the Operation Cast Lead and then Goldstone becomes, you know, this, uh, you know, according to Netanyahu, this nemesis of, of Israel and his critiques, et cetera. So one of the things that, you know, it seems now, and my question, I think that is, you know, it seems, at least in terms of public appearance that, you know, politics has prevailed over law. Like Israel is basically doing much more intensively what it's been doing since 2008, nine in terms of the bombing and lack of distinction, et cetera. You know, so the point is if, if part of the role of um, law is to legitimize war for domestic audiences, I think it's like the Israeli majoritarian, Jewish Israeli majoritarian public, does, you know, killing Palestinians, you know, regardless of whether it's legal or not, is, you know, sort of the bonding uh, exercise. And there's no, you know, there's no uh, gestures towards Palestinians at all anymore in terms of like any kind of hearts and minds, you know, like, oh, look, we're, we're, we're waging war in a very discretionary way. And with the international community, it's basically like they're just banking on America's willingness to block all uh, meaningful criticism or consequences on that level. So, you know, I think it's just, it seems like, you know, the hell with law these days, you know. Thanks, Bob. Um, we have two questions now from Mark Garlasco. First one is, uh, to what extent do Judge Advocate General's Corps JAG lawyers limit military actions in accordance with international humanitarian law as opposed to 
enabling military action despite international humanitarian law, which kind of goes to the, the heart of the, the arguments that you're making, Craig. And then the second question from Mark is, uh, the vast majority of civilian deaths in war are lawful. Is this because military lawyers don't do enough to prosecute violators, or is it because IHL, international humanitarian law, is so permissive to militaries? Thank you, Mark. Great questions. I've been following your work for many years, so I'm, I'm glad that you're on the call. Thanks for coming. It's important work what you're doing now with Human Rights Watch. Um, I would say, uh, to Jack's limit, yeah, I th I, look, I think military lawyers are called in, they're part of the operations in, in the sort of background, in the bureaucracy and in the sort of front end, you know, can we target, can we not, that sort of dramatization. Uh, and they are giving advice both uh, about law, both about, you know, rules of engagement, which I know you know a lot about, I think. Um, and in terms of everything else outside of the law, and that is packaged as part of their legal advice. So all of the lawyers, you know, without exception, I think, give advice in terms of risk. It's not simply a question of yes or no, or, or it's always should or shouldn't. Here's three options, and here's why, because of the potential outfall. Here's the risk to CNN, the CNN effect. This, you know, if we if we target this and um, it, it's civilian casualties, then ISIS will pick that up. So again, one of the interviews I was uh, having recently uh, was um, they have a, a I can't remember they called it Mega Twitter. It's like their own special uh, mil U.S. military account that they have, which is uh, algorithmically sucks up. Um, all stuff that's like anti-US uh, military and, and they'll have this live feed up on the wall so when they bomb and it has effects, if the Taliban, if Al-Qaeda, if, if ISIS pick it up and run with it, you know, for, and use certain hashtags, then they can, they can counter it. And their metric is, if it appears on that Twitter feed, we've lost. If, it, if we see it in our operational room, uh, we've lost. And so I think lots of advice, if, if, I hope that answers your question, is about every, things outside of the law be that you know enabling or constraining and i think actually most of the constraints and this speaks to the room of violence within the law most of the constraints have nothing to do with the law it's like let's not do it because that you know the, the quote that what that one of the discussants read out because it will have a negative effect negative strategic effect uh on us and then the the second question uh i can't find it in front of me uh it was about the um yeah, the majority of civilian deaths are lawful. Uh, I think the answer to the question is that they are, it's lawful both because of the uh, what is permissible within the laws of war and because there's a failure to investigate. I think, you know, I mean, the, the book is really about the former uh, rather than the latter, although it shows the, um, I wouldn't say incompetence. Uh, I'm sure you've been involved in, in investigations and those sorts of things yourself. They're highly competent. They're, you know, many thousands of pages often. They're very forensic and, and uh, careful in, in, in their documentation of what happens. But I think it all comes down to, in, in the law, it's the Renderlich rule, which states that, you know, what did the military commander know at the time of the attack? And those investigations seem to know that the commander didn't have enough information or the right information and the attack went ahead and that loads of civilians ended up dying. And you can investigate, you can both allow for that in the law, and when you come to investigate it, you can find that that's allowed in the law. And, and those, that, that's part and parcel uh, of the same thing. So investigative structures in international law allow for militaries to investigate themselves, which I think is obviously, you know, structurally inadequate. And that's why Chris said, you know, about the additional protocols. That's why the US and Israel don't sign up to the additional protocols, partly. And it's also the reason why both refuse to recognize the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, because they don't want a real uh, investigative body to come in and, and do that work uh, for them. Thanks, Craig. Oh, okay. Catherine? Just, just like a, a, a really small sort of item is like, I think, you know, part of what's intriguing in the book, but also trying to figure out is like, you know, what are the kind of risk assessments that are conducted, right? And what is the sort of a different objectives that different actors are dealing with, right? And like Lisa's really correct to point out like the, the, the changes in Israel's relationship to, to bombing in, in the Gaza Strip. And it's like, you know, does it, like, does it feel that Gaza can be bombed into submission? And if it doesn't feel, then what are the objectives, right? And I think it's kind of like, what are those risk assessment discussions that are going on and how lawyers play a role in what might be right to, 
to not necessarily win, but annihilation, right? I would just add, you know, I mean, in terms of Mark uh, Garlesco's second point, I mean, you know, Craig's book does a really wonderful job in terms of how the law makes targets. And so the sort of the evolving notion of what's targetable. And in that regard, just to do a pitch for another uh, couple of friends book that should, you know, would be, it goes very well with Craig's book is Neve Gordon and Nicola Perugini's Human Shields. And so reading those books together really helps answer some of these questions. Thank you. We have a question from Christopher Harker. Are there important differences between Israel and the US in addition to and aside from the forms of mutual learning and crossover that we've been talking about? Thanks, Chris. I'm glad that you could join. I've enjoyed your book, a recently published book as well, um, Spaces of Debt, another plug. Um, Chris, I think there are, and, and, and to some extent, the book doesn't do justice to those sort of intricate differences and maybe perhaps uh, too broad a brushstroke between the similarities, uh, although, although they're similarities that I think are important. I think actually one of the key sets of differences that they're, they're dealing with is uh, not so much in terms of the specific interpretations, but literally in terms of the very different ways in which they need to fight war because of the sorts of territory that are under occupation or under control or under invasion. One of the key things, obviously, I mean, you know, notwithstanding the, the long occupation of Afghanistan and Iraq, um, because part of the missions there have been the, the so-called Iraqification or Afghanistanification, which means the transfer of responsibilities onto their troops to do our fighting for us, uh, you have you have sort of less uh, troops on the ground, but historically, uh, or sort of in the contemporary, what that means is you have local forces, uh, with all due respect to the militaries of those nations, uh, not great militaries, uh, calling in uh, air support and, and and doing strikes from the ground from from above, and so you have you don't have U.S. troops on the ground as much these days, uh, and you're you're calling in. Uh, uh, strikes uh, from from local military forces, and that has resulted in, and I'm, you know, Mark Glasgow on the call uh, has been involved in a report around this, tends to lead to massive amounts of civilian casualties because of the errors in communication, because of the technology, for various different reasons. Partly because it's fast, i.e., Iraqi troops, you know, in in urban warfare situations, getting 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 called in and 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 and, and calling in strikes and and. Um, so that leads to problems. That's very different to a situation in which, you know, Gaza, uh, so, so Israel hasn't conducted lethal targeting operations in, in, in the West Bank since about 2006, partly because of an Israeli Supreme Court ruling. But the intelligence, the oversight is so integrated, is so much more sophisticated because of the territory is so small, because of uh, the particular geographies of Gaza, that you don't have to rely on uh, second and third uh, actors to call in strikes. It's sort of an integrated whole you have, I think, di just a different sort of geography uh, uh, of violence, which gives, gives rise to uh, the kinds of violence that you see. So I don't think it's incidental, like it would be very difficult for the US to do, for example, to, to destroy those whole buildings in the way in which Israel is doing today. And that's partly because of the fictions around, you know, who controls territory. And if you had troops on the ground, why the hell would you ever destroy an entire building like that when there are other sort of less destructive ways of, in, of engaging that building. So that leads, of course, to all kinds of, of different interpretations in the law, but I'd say that they stem from the geography. I would say that as a geographer, of course. Thanks, Craig. We are up against time. We have a last question from Lauren Gould that I think kind of <laughs> gets it. It's the, big, it's the big question that we're all confronted with. Uh, well, there's also a question from inside the house from Lars, uh, who's interested if you can say something at the very end about how this project connects up with your new project on war and, and wounding. Um, the way that I would preface um, Lauren Gould's question is just to point folks who are undoubtedly going to buy the book after this uh, presentation of it to look at page um, 308 and 309, which for me was um, a particularly chilling discussion of the way in which um, two things are happening through these through the kill chain that you describe. One is that responsibility for um, the dominant force is getting dispersed so that nobody on the attacking or the, the more powerful side is responsible in a kind of a traditional way. And the second is that 
responsibility for being targeted is put onto the people being targeted. And you, you say it um, in quite a nice way. And to me, that just feels like kind of a classical colonial logic that is getting intensified now in ways that you go into quite nicely in the book. And so Lauren Gould asks, or says, um, something I quite agree with, Craig beautifully describes how lawyers are at the court instituting Western state violence and how they legally enable not regulate war, how they provide the language to legitimize it, and lawyers are a key actor in the at the table on the practice of war through the kill chain that you discuss in detail. To an extent that uh, military personnel are increasingly encultured to believe they wage war because it is legal and seemingly less and less reflect, that is the soldiers, on what political goals they are not achieving. My question is, in the face of this, how can academics like yourself, like us, like folks on the call and civil society in general contest warfare in the 21st century, as we're actually you know, seeing it happen this week at last? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lauren. Really great to have you here uh, from your amazing program, uh, The Intimacies of Remote Warfare. Um, look, if other people want to chime in, if we've got time, please do so. So let me try and go quickly. Look, the, I think that the contest from academics, from whatever you're going to call it, civil society, from human rights organizations has to be multi-pronged and therefore I'd be reticent to suggest, you know, be programmatic about what form we should take. For example, Lisa on the call and I have maybe different opinions on in terms of whether law should be used as part of that sort of weapon going forward uh, in the fight and, and whether it's not. I think I'm more cynical about that. Yet I think that simultaneous calls to use the language of law can be strategically useful because I think that law has a power to delegitimize what it is that it's being done. So calling things disproportionate, calling it war crimes, I, th I think is actually part of the problem, but it wouldn't necessarily, you know, I think that that's a language which, for example, Palestinians uh, in the language of human rights have specifically harnessed, uh, I think with, not without problem, but I think if, if, if the victims of violence are asking us to speak in ter terms of certain iconographies, image sharing and legal discourses, then maybe it's a responsibility for us to do so and to strengthen our institutions in order to respond to uh, those calls which are being made. But I, I just think, you know, oh, oh, sorry. I, I think that, that but this would be my plug generally for, uh, for uh, a broader anti-war politics. And, and you know, I, I know that to talk about, you know, pacifism is sort of seen as, as wantonly naive, and, and maybe I am. Um, but I think a truly anti-war politics, and this is where the book ends, that's, that's against the entirety of war, that's against apartheid, that's against occupation having some sort of, you know, I know we're skeptical of universalisms here at ISRF, but having something that's closer to a universalism than a, um, a, a division of, of, of tasks and politics. We've, we're against torture, or we're against drones, or we're against knock on roof, or we're against all these tactics. It's like, let's remember the bigger picture and, and fight violence sort of in its entirety. So if we're gonna be engaged with these things, we need to be engaged with a critique of all aerial warfare, or all military invasions and so things. I mean, maybe that's an obvious point. But I think that there's many things that we can do. We need to not necessarily only do one thing. Lisa, did you want to come in there? Yeah, I just wanted to, I mean, because it's something that I've, you know, I think about a lot. I think it's an excellent question. And, you know, in some sense, for the kind of critiques or anti-war positions, I mean, we're really, you know, it's a battle on one hand, it's a battle for narratives. And so it's so important for people like Craig to write books that help other people understand the military from inside the military. Because the best way to, you know, I mean, it's sort of, you have to like get inside that which you dislike in order to become an expert so that then you can like use your brain to beat other people, you know, on the, um, on the narrative ground. And I'm also like a huge starry-eyed optimist about lawfare. It's like viva la litigation, you know, so I think in some sense it's like, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, the war crimes, uh, pursuit of war crimes will, you know, it may not succeed in the immediate, in our lifetime even, but like even talking about it and thinking about it is one way to, you know, be battling for those narratives. Catherine. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree with, with Lisa and saying that, you know, the work that Craig does in this text is one of the things that's really important. And I think kind of pointing out 
the tensions and inconsistencies within the bureaucracy itself, right? And how they end up disagreeing with each other and pointing out like tensions and gaps and issues where, so for like, for example, like this idea of, you know, the, the compression of, of time, making it um, easier to, to target is sort of herald as something that is celebrated within the intelligence community saying, oh, look, we've developed these new methods of predator drone allows us to kill. And then that's also sort of an issue because then, right, that makes it harder to actually find out whether things are appropriate targets or not, right? So they kind of pointing out those tensions within the, the bureaucracy itself um, and making fun of it, which I think the book does right like it kind of really pointedly kind of critiques their it's itself like the, the the stories that they tell themselves about what they're doing um so thanks craig that was great uh chris will i go ahead and respond to the other two quick things here yes um and i just want to give permission uh, lisa is on us time and she's teaching in five minutes and so lisa if, if you want to disappear please please go ahead and thanks for everyone for bearing with us in terms of the time and everything um Chris, you, you highlighted, I had to go and look up the specific page in the book there just because I you know, couldn't remember. So I found it. I know what you're talking about. The key thing, I think you're absolutely right. The idea that um, responsibility transfer happens not just across mili within militaries, but now increasingly also to the populations has, has been a sort of, uh, you know, a long uh, colonial tactic. So I think we see this most clearly right now in Gaza whereby civilians are ipso facto counted as combatants or having a proximity uh, to combatants, i.e. they're being, you know, human shielded, whether they like it or not. Um, bye, Lisa, thank you. They're, be, they're, they're constituted as human shield and therefore they're targetable. Um, and, and that then pushes the responsibility onto them, i.e., which is to say, you leave, must leave your home. You must evacuate. You're already a refugee, a 1948 refugee, but we want you to leave your house for a second time. Evacuate, we don't know where to, of course, because there's nowhere necessarily to go, um, uh, to evacuate. So it puts that onus, uh, as you say, uh, in a sort of profoundly clear way, in which the presumption of innocence, which is what international law says, there's a presumption of civilianness, it turns it on its head in, in, in Gaza and other particular spaces. It's a presumption of military status therefore targetable, therefore expendable. And it's up to the civilian populations to prove they're not a civilian. And, and one, I know that these acts of imagination aren't necessarily helpful and, and Palestinians are sort of asking us not to do it because you know we don't, it's okay for us to sit here and imagine scenarios, but they're experiencing it. But if we imagine that scenario brought over here for me in my home, sitting out here in, in, in Newcastle to have to prove my civilianness, otherwise, uh, to, 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 to have a responsibility to know that someone might be doing terrorist activities next door. It's something we would never ask uh, of Jewish Israeli populations. It's something we would never ask uh, of Western populations by and large. The last thing I'll say very quickly, just to um, link to the wounding research. In some ways, the research that has been amazingly and generously funded by the ISRF is uh, um, a rejoiner to the problems in my book, which is to say, in the book, I did what Lisa said, which is sort of become obsessed with these bureaucracies. You enter the military mind in order to sort of understand it. And in some ways, I think it went sort of too far down that thinking, this, you know, a sort of Stockholm syndrome of, 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 of over empathizing with the military structures. I was obsessed, that is to say, in one way or another, with how militaries come to kill. And I neglected the ways in which, in some ways, it is the non lethal effects on populations, on infrastructures that can have depending on how you look at it, in some ways as important or even more devastating effects on those populations. It's also a way of accounting for who it is that I talk to, where my politics are in terms of who I'm speaking with, who is, is enabled a voice, because although the book is engaged in a critique of violence, it's not one that includes very well, for example, Palestinian, Iraqi uh, and Afghani voices. So I want to account, you know, to sort of, um, take that more seriously and to look at what happens to especially civilians when they are injured and the lives that they have and the sort of trauma the never-ending chronic traumas that they live with as a result of this military violence which will always be outside of the calculatory logics which i've so far documented in order to lodge a second critique on 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 this military machine first that the law enables the violence in which we need to it enables violence which we need to push back on and secondly, that all this violence will be done in ways in which we will never see, which will be undocumented, which will go unheard. So thank you.
And when's your new book coming out? Oh, that's a big question. Yeah, lots of writing to do before then, but papers are on the way. And yeah, I just want to say, you know, thanks for the support at ISRF. It's been amazing. And I couldn't have, I couldn't have disseminated the book and I couldn't have done the research, you know, on Gaza. I've been writing about the Great March of Return on, and the, um, uh, and the um, sniper uh, uh, attacks that, that Catherine uh, talked about in the Great March of Return. 7,000 people were shot. And so, yeah, I've been I'm writing about that. There's more papers coming. I'm sure you'll Help me get the word out about those for, for people who are interested. Um, that is all we have time for. I, I want to thank you three now, too, for um, doing such a great job illuminating this complex and, and horrifying issue. Uh, and also to the audience for, for coming and stick, hanging in and uh, offering these uh, quite important questions. Um, See you next time, next month, where we'll be talking about solar energy and then back to, to war in July. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you for joining us. For ISRF updates and information about future events, please sign up to our mailing list at www.isrf.org forward slash mailing list. See you again soon. Goodbye.